for organizing this great conference and uh, by saying that I'm very glad to be here. Being an old time friend of Alex, I, I benefited enormously from him as a student in a classroom, then as a co-author, and now as a friend. I am very honored to, to have this occasion to, to, to attend this conference. Uh, I, when Guido was talking before about his experience with Alex, I was impressed because I had got exactly the same kind of experience as sitting down trying to solve problems and then, you know, having to move to a classroom that was not big enough and filling up blackboards of algebra. And the one I kept, I still, you know, like when I had to study this difficult paper by Frank, is don't surrender. I mean, you look at the problem and I try to say it's too difficult and Alex would say, it's not difficult. Well, what is it? It's just, you know, a system equation. Let's, let's look at it. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, this good spirit that uh, I got from him, and I hope uh, I'll, I'll keep with me. Okay. What is that? So we have to wait a minute. I could tell more stories about what Alex The second one is commitment. And uh, I think this will be an important point of my presentation. What is commitment? In my view, commitment is when you solve the problem, you, mi you maxim or minimize the second line subject to the first equation. When you solve under commitment, the key point of commitment is that you take into account that some variables are not predetermined. You take account of all the constraints and their law of motion. The other two regimes under learning that they consider is, uh, so expectations, the E star now is, uh, obeys uh, an autoregression, some parameter CT minus one, least squares, uh, and, and then under this expectation mechanism, they solve two problems. One is this, what they call a simple rule. Basically, the guy, the policymaker, just implements the discretionary rule, forgetting about uh, what the public sector, uh, that, that's how I understood it, and a sophisticated rule. And now let's, let's see, okay, so here it is. What they do under learning, this is key. So the first I call, they call it in the paper, a uh, simple uh, rule. So under this learning scheme, X is chosen period by period as a, like a proportion to the cost shock. It's more interesting, in my view, the sophisticated policy. Sophisticated policy does this. Like the, the, the X is chosen uh, to minimize, the, the, this is like the recursive formulation, to minimize the, the quadratic loss function but taking into account, that's what the value function arguments C and R tell you, taking into account that the way you choose policy also affects the learning scheme by the private agent. And this is very nice uh, from, uh, I think, I mean, it's, it's a very nice uh, control problem. You, you not only try to optimize the objective, but you take account that these guys are learning and you want to choose a policy that makes them learn well. And they solve this under the Phillips curve. So notice, this, in this case, the, the policymaker knows that pi t obeys a forward-looking equation, even though the expectations operator is a strange object, is not rational expectation, and the expectations law of motion. Okay, what they find? Well, first, that policy, the policy rule you use influences, affects the speed of learning, uh, the persistence of pi. Second, the sophisticated rule uh, gives rise to outcomes that are very similar to the commitment outcomes. Uh, as Frank showed. But they argue the mechanism is very different. I will argue it is not different. So just to anticipate, probably my main point is that, in my view, their sophisticated rule is commitment. And finally, they show that the optimal rule implies a strong response to inflation, and therefore fast learning. Just to keep in mind, I mean, before I move to my comments, I, I, there is a paper by a, a colleague of mine, a student of Albert Marcet, Giuseppe Ferrero, who provides some analytics that are really very helpful to understand how these models work. So let me try to, to tell you the story that I learned from Giuseppe. He tells me when you look at these models with learning, you have two objects, two kind of things you have to think about. There's a true law of motion and there's a perceived law of motion. Now, think of A like the parameters of the true model. What happens, right, when, and, and T of A is the perceived law of motion. So you give the agents uh, one value here, maybe they believe the true parameters of this, then some data are generated, they run regression, and they learn another parameter. So this is the way they learn. The, the, the law, the, that T is a locus that describes the 
dynamics of the perceived law of motion. How perceived law of motion depends, maybe you start from a belief that's here, then you will go up to the arrow to think that the perceived, the, 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 you run a regression and you will estimate parameters like T of A, so next time, next period you're here, and then on, and you converge in the end eventually, if you don't discount, if you don't throw away observation, in the end you converge here, which is like rational expectation. In the end, you think the parameters are here, you behave according to these parameters, some data are generated, you run your regression, again, the parameters are here. So the, that's a fixed point. And what Giuseppe shows is that monetary policy, in, in a model exactly like theirs, monetary policy affects the slope of this TA. So when you are very, when the policy maker is highly inflation averse, the high gamma pi, the, these are, are from Giuseppe's notation, but anyway, gamma is like the, the reaction function coefficient to inflation. The locus TA is very flat, so what happens, you know, is you converge very fast. So persistence is low and convergence is fast. The, fa the speed of convergence and persistence are kind of the same thing. Instead, when the, when the policy is not very inflation averse, the TA locus is like near 45 degree and you can get very, very slow persistence. Uh, this is useful to keep in mind. Is this the same gamma as in No, France? no, no. The gamma, you can think of it like uh, it's a, a coefficient of a, need, of a Taylor rule that it's the response to inflation by the policymaker. It's the alpha in Frank's model. It's the alpha, the intensity with, with which you respond to inflation or cost shocks. So my discussion focuses on the following points. First, I want to comment on the, on the mechanics of the sophisticated rule, how it works and why it produces these results. Then I want to uh, propose a critique of the welfare criterion that's used in the paper. And not only in this paper. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in this learning literature, so maybe, uh, but that's more fun, I think, as a discussion. And then I'll have some loose comments about. Uh... OK, so because I'm not an expert, let me begin with some preliminaries. You know, what I, what I, what I know, what I took notes of about learning stuff. So from Honkapoya and Margaret Bray. Uh, so I learned that literature on least square learning you know, initially it started by asking questions, okay, we know rational expectation is beautiful, but, you know, how do you get there? This point that everybody knows that, and, and a natural question is, you know, if people really don't know the system but just run regressions, would they converge to a rational expectations equilibrium? So one nice result is that if the people have in mind the right functional form for the underlying model, and they do not discount the past, so they don't throw away observations, asymptotically, you can learn the true model. Then there are complications like e-stability and stuff, but let me take this first order. Like, so with no discounting of past observation, a necessary condition to converge to rational expectations is that the perceived functional form of the expectation nests the true one, right? So their discretion case satisfies this principle. Under discretion, they assume the public runs an autoregression, pi t, and estimate this CT coefficient. And we know, we can solve the theoretical model, that the true law of motion of inflation and that the rational expectation law of motion of inflation is actually an autoregression. So, so you can learn it if you don't discount. With discounting, you can learn it with probability one. With discounting, probably you get convergence in distribution. I think the picture that, uh, that Frank showed uh, illustrated just that. But now, first, first point, why does the sophisticated rule look like commitment? This is a question that they have. Well, my answer is because it is commitment. Now, you shouldn't do this in presentations with too many questions, but here I need it. This is the sophisticated rule. It's minimization of one subject to two, three, four, and five. Now, one and two is a standard commitment problem. Three minutes. So this is like a standard commitment problem. You are taking account of the, for, of the forward-looking nature, of the non-predetermined nature of the second equation. Plus, you have some other constraints. But I argue these other constraints are not necessarily hindering you to implement exactly the same commitment. You know, after all, we know that rational expectation models have, uh, when, once you solve them, they have an autoregressive autoregressive representation. So let me give you this intuition. 
Assume that the agents can learn the model. So there's no discounting and assume the equilibrium is learnable. Asymptotically, the E star will behave like E. It will be some outer regression that correctly describes the law of motion of the system. Then just look at that problem asymptotically. That's exactly a commitment problem. So one could ask, so why is it that, you know, if my claim is right, why is it that their results are a little bit different from a commitment outcomes? They still differ. Well, in part is due to discounting. So with discounting, you, it's kind of hard really to learn the true model. But the true motive for me is the assumption that we do here. Assume that you can learn the true model. And in their model, the agents cannot learn the true model. Because with commitment, the law of motion of inflation, you know, their agents are running this first order autoregression. But with commitment, the law, the optimal policy has a, has a Lagrange multiplier, takes, count, takes account of history, what uh, Frank called history dependence. So it's actually, I think, a second, order, a second order difference equation for inflation because there is a relation that links the phi t psi t minus 1 to, to pi t minus 2. So I think agents in this setup cannot learn the rational expectation commitment. My guess is that if they do what Frank suggested in his last slide, so always give the agents a second order uh, uh, autoregression, which nests both the simple case, because in the simple case C2 is just equal to zero, and this sophisticated case, and try, you know, just to see if I'm right or wrong, try without discounting and let them run for th uh, th 20,000 periods, I think you get exactly the commitment equilibrium. So quickly, other points on the welfare criterion. Every time I see like this kind of papers with the quadratic loss function, I ask myself, do I like, so I've used it a lot, so I can ask it because I'm not, so, you know. <laughs> so do, am I doing something wrong by this approximation? And the one way is, is I ask, you know, it's a second order approximation. Why doesn't it have a first order term? Because it's the first thing that you do, right, when you take the derivative. Well, then you look in Woodford's book and you know that so u is the true utility, and you take a second order approximation, there's some quadratic term, and there is a first order term, of course. But the point is that then you read the book and it says, but now let's assume that you are looking at this system at an efficient steady state and deterministic. So the psi, which is like all the random stuff, is, is switched off, and the, the, the steady state that you're looking at is efficient. So this first order term, because you're looking at an optimum, is zero. And then the approximation under this assumption is correct for small fluctuations about this steady state. But here, I doubt that these assumptions are really uh, are correct because the, we know that under learning, the system can take very large deviations and stay away from the for a long time. Just an example, using those pictures that I showed before. Suppose that the, that the policymaker, suppose that there is an inflation bias or that for whatever reason the policymaker prefers low inflation to high inflation. Then if you use a policy that converges very slowly and you start from low inflation, it can be good because you will have low inflation for a long time. Whereas the opposite holds if the initial conditions were you, you were starting from a hyperinflation, then you want to go for this policy because bsh, it kills inflation very fast. I mean, Taking account of first order terms has implication for the speed of convergence, which depend on the initial conditions of the system. You don't see this in the quadratic approximation because there's no first order terms, but I think that this may be um, important when in a setup with learning. So I'll just go to the conclusion. I enjoyed reading the paper. It's an elegant control problem, and uh, I learned some tools that I think can be useful for more application. But I think before lecturing the private sector what they have to, how they have to learn, there are some things that need to be done. First, I would like everybody to have the same information. As policymakers, we kind of like the idea that we are so much more knowledgeable than the rest of the economy, but maybe, you know, that's not a good assumption. Uh, I would like to find a way to use a sounder welfare criterion. For example, I don't think Frank needs this second order approximation. His problem is already highly nonlinear, so there's no benefit from, you could go for directly for, uh, you know, uh, 
using the utility function of the representative agent in the value function problem. And finally, I think it would be useful to explore the robustness properties of these rules because learning is a great idea to, to bring in. Uh, and in my view, one big question is, you know, we have to be careful to do this fine tuning uh, of the learning rule. One, one interesting question is if the private sector doesn't know, uh, really doesn't use rational expectation, how robust are our uh, approximate rules to, to, to this uh, new equilibrium?